Hi, this is the Mosomic MEMS microphone guide. My name is Mikko Suvanto. In this episode I continue talking about the electrical implementation of digital microphones into devices. More specifically, digital clocks, interface timing, I.O. levels and the dynamic range of a digital signal path. Stay tuned! This series is sponsored by Infineon Technologies. A digital MEMS microphone interface needs a clock to set the timing of the interface so that the microphone and the other devices connected to the interface do what they do at the right time and at the right frequency. A microphone with a PDM interface needs a relatively high clock frequency because the ability of a PDM interface to have a good noise performance requires that the sampling is done at a very high frequency. The maximum bandwidth of the captured sound can be calculated with this equation. Bandwidth equals F clock divided by 2 times the OSR, where OSR is the oversampling ratio. Calculated with the typical oversampling ratio of 64, a 2.4 MHz clock frequency results in an 18,750 Hz maximum capturing frequency. This is high enough for most audio applications, since most people cannot hear frequencies higher than this, and signal processing algorithms don't typically operate at frequencies this high. Other typical clock frequencies for PDM MEMS microphones used for capturing audio frequencies are 3.072, 3.2 and 4.8 MHz. A 6 MHz clock gives you a capturing bandwidth of almost 47 kHz, which is high enough also for most ultrasonic applications. From that same equation we can derive that the clock frequency needed for a given sound frequency bandwidth is 2 times the OSR times the bandwidth. I'll save a more in-depth discussion about things like quantization noise, oversampling, oversampling ratio, decimation factor, noise shaping and Nyquist frequency for a later video. Let me know in the comments below if these things are something you'd like to learn about. In many MEMS microphones with a PDM interface, the clock frequency can be used to set the microphone into different operating modes. The modes can be, for example, a normal mode in which the microphone operates at full performance and full current consumption. A high performance mode in which the performance is as high as it can be without much consideration given for current consumption. This can also be an ultrasonic mode that enables a very wide capturing bandwidth. Another mode commonly used in PDM microphones is low power mode, in which the current consumption is reduced at the expense of performance. Another mode worth mentioning is the sleep mode, in which the microphone is inactive and consumes a minimal amount of current, but is ready to return to full operation without significant delay. The host system must naturally also support change in the clock frequency. It should be noted that the mode change may not be free of glitches or other disturbances. Therefore, it may be a good idea to mute the audio signal at the host system during the switching. Disturbances can be caused either by the microphone or the host system. The interface clock determines the operating frequency of the MEMS microphone, but there are also finer details about the clock that have to be taken into account to make sure that the system works properly. The requirements for important timing related parameters can be found in MEMS microphone datasheets. If only one type of microphone is used, the only risk is that the timings of the microphone and the host system don't match. In a multi-microphone system, in which the microphones may not all be the same type, or even from the same microphone manufacturer, the risk is higher. If the timings of two microphones on the same data line are in conflict, the result may be, for example, that both microphones assert data onto the data line simultaneously. This is likely to cause unpredictable system behavior and data errors. Let's have a look at the key timing parameters. First of all, there are requirements for the host system clock. Clock frequency is the frequency at which the analog audio signal is sampled. 
Clock duty cycle is the percentage of one clock cycle that the clock signal is high. Duty cycle is often specified as a range, for example from 40% to 60%. The duty cycle requirement may vary depending on interface clock frequency. In practice, the edges of the clock that the microphones receive have finite rising and falling times. Limits have to be set for these rise and fall times to make sure that the timings of the microphones and the host system are compatible. Clock rise time is the maximum time it takes for the clock signal to rise from zero to a specified level. The level must be specified together with the time. It can be, for example, 50% of the microphone supply voltage. Clock fall time is the maximum time it takes for the clock signal to fall from the level that's interpreted as a high clock to a specified level. Again, the lower level at which the measurement is stopped must be specified. The maximum allowed clock rise and fall times are typically measured in nanoseconds. Here are all the host system clock parameters once more. Then there are requirements for the timing of the microphone. Delay time for data driven is the delay from the clock edge to the point in time when the data has been asserted onto the data line. The exact point of the clock edge is often specified as the point of time when the clock reaches 50% of the supply voltage. Delay time for data valid is the delay from the clock edge to the point in time when the data asserted by the microphone is valid. Data valid means that the data is accurately readable by the receiving system. Data valid voltage levels for a digital zero and a digital one must be specified together with the delay time for data valid. The levels can be, for example, less than 0.3 times the supply voltage for a zero and more than 0.7 times the supply voltage for a one. Delay time for data high Z is the delay from the clock edge to the point in time when the data output of the microphone switches into a high impedance state. In the high impedance state, the microphone becomes electrically invisible, so the other microphone on the same data line is free to assert data without conflict. The delay time for high Z must be shorter than the delay for data assertion. Otherwise, the other microphone on the same data line may try to assert data while the other one is still holding its data valid on the line. Here are all the microphone timing requirements once more. As you just saw when I listed the interface timing parameters, the I.O. levels are an essential part of the interface specification. I.O. stands for input and output. The voltage levels specify, for example, what voltage levels are interpreted as a digital 1, a logic high, and what levels as a digital zero, a logic low. Ensuring that the interface, the components, and the host work together seamlessly requires that the voltage levels are also specified. Let's have a look at what those key digital voltage levels are. Input logic high level is the range of voltages that the microphone interprets as a logic high. Input logic low level is the range of voltages that the microphone interprets as a logic low. Hysteresis width is the distance between the thresholds when a logic low switches to a logic high and when a logic high switches to a logic low. Output logic high level is the range of microphone output voltages that the host interprets as a logic high. Output logic low level is the range of microphone output voltages that the host interprets as a logic low. The output current is specified together with the output logic high and low levels. Here are the I.O. voltages once more. Also, the output load capacitance affects the timing and voltage levels on the data line. This is typically taken into account 
by specifying in the microphone datasheet the maximum output load capacitance that the microphone can drive. The value can be, for example, 200 picofarads. The interface timing specifications will not be valid for load capacitances bigger than the specified maximum. Let's talk a little about the requirements for the digital signal path through which the microphone output signal travels. The signal path must be designed to maintain the signal quality that the microphone is capable of. A key part of this is disturbance immunity that I addressed in previous episodes. I'll also return to that subject in the next episode. Another key thing in terms of signal quality is dynamic range. Like I've explained in earlier episodes, the two bookends of the dynamic range are the noise floor and the acoustic overload point of the system. I talked about the signal-to-noise separation in a microphone system in episode 7, but in that study I didn't take into account the digital noise sources and factors that may limit the maximum signal level that can pass through. For a PDM signal, the maximum signal level is limited in the digital domain by the full-scale signal level. The maximum level is reached, at least theoretically, when the bitstream is all ones. In reality, the signal cannot quite reach the full level of all ones, at least without becoming unstable. Typically, there are also components in the signal path that handle PCM signals instead of PDM signals. These are, for example, codecs. Before these components, the PDM signal must naturally be converted to a PCM signal. In the world of PCM signals, the SNR of a component, such as a codec, is a similar parameter as dynamic range is for a MEMS microphone. It's the difference between the maximum and minimum signal levels the component can handle. It's measured in decibels. The dynamic range, or SNR, of a digital component is determined by its bit depth. It's calculated with the equation you see here. Dynamic range equals 6.02 times n plus 1.76 decibels, where n is the bit depth. Typical bit depths for audio components are 16, 20 and 24. The dynamic range of a high-performance mouse microphone with a 132 dB SPL acoustic overload point and 72 dB SNR, which corresponds to a noise flow of 22 dB SPL, is 110 decibels. That means that the digital components in the microphone output signal path must also have a dynamic range of at least 110 decibels. By using the equation here, we can calculate that the bit depths of the digital components must be at least 17.6. This means that a 16-bit component isn't good enough, so a 20-bit component should be chosen. A 16-bit component would do if the dynamic range would be less than 98 decibels. A 20-bit component is good enough for dynamic ranges up to 122 decibels. A digital PCM component can also degrade the microphone output signal by limiting its frequency range. The key parameter here is the sampling rate. Based on the Nyquist theorem, the maximum bandwidth of the signal is half the sampling frequency. For an audio signal that goes up to 20 kHz, the sampling frequency must be at least 40 kHz. Typical sampling rates found in digital devices that enable capturing the whole audio range are 44.1, which is the rate used in CDs, and 48 kHz. If you want to enable a hi-fi experience for bats, cows and Neil Young, you should go up to a 96 kHz sampling rate. Let's have a look at another important feature of the PDM interface, the left-right selection. Like I explained earlier, the left-right selection enables connecting two PDM microphones to the same data line. The way it works is that there is a digital interface circuitry in the microphone that makes it react differently to rising and falling edges of the clock signal. On a rising clock edge, one of the multiplexed channels asserts data onto the data line, 
meaning that it writes a data bit onto the data line. The other microphone on the line goes into a high impedance, high Z state, meaning in practice that it makes itself invisible to the data line. On a falling clock edge, the roles are switched, meaning that now it's time for the other channel to assert data onto the data line while the other channel goes quiet. This means that on each clock cycle, both microphones get to assert one bit, either a zero or a one, into the data output. That's how the multiplexing works. The data pin of the microphone is typically specified to be in a high impedance state when the microphone is in sleep mode, otherwise known as standby mode. Okay, that's it for this episode. In episode 20, I'll continue talking about the electrical implementation of MEMS microphones into devices. That episode will be about EMC, electromagnetic and electrical compatibility. I hope I'll see you around. Cheers! If you have any questions or comments, write them down in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. You can also contact me online or on social media. If you liked what you saw here, give a like for the video and subscribe to the Mosomic channel. That way you help me reach more people and thereby create more content. If you need more in-depth microphone training than what you saw here, contact me and we can arrange it. The training can be adapted to suit any interests and skill levels and the customer can choose the location and duration of the course. Mosomic provides also consultation services in all things related to MEMS microphones. If you're a microphone buyer, I can help you select the right components for your product and manage your microphone suppliers. I can also assist in implementing the microphones into your device. For microphone manufacturers, I provide microphone marketing, product definition, product management and development management services. I can also help you create all kinds of MEMS microphone documentation.